we want to be able to protect the things that we're purchasing is super foundational and super key. I think the mistake that I see people make the most, I say about 80% of real estate investors have insurance policies that will fail them. And I sometimes I think that number is low when I see the mm. policies come in. When, when someone comes to me, I say, hey, let, show me what you've got right now. I'll go out to my company, see what I can get, get and I'll compare those things. And when someone shows me what they have so often, they have policies that are junk. It's their absolute junk. And, and I think the biggest mistake I see people make is thinking that insurance is just a transactional commodity and that we should just buy the cheapest possible policy we can find. Welcome to the Threefold Real Estate Investing Podcast. This is the podcast where you'll not only learn how you can achieve massive success in multifamily real estate investing, but also how you can simultaneously pursue great relationships with your family and a better walk with God. You can achieve financial freedom through real estate investing without sacrificing the relationships that mean the most to you. Now, here's your host, Lee Yoder. Welcome back, three full listeners. Got another great guest today. Uh, excited to, to bring Jeremy Goodrich on here. Let me read a little bit about him and then we'll bring him on. He is a commercial real estate insurance advisor who's been teaching investors how to buy and protect property since 2013. He's the owner of Shine Insurance. We're going to talk a lot about that. But uh, the way I actually know Jeremy is he is the host of the Managing Commercial Real Estate Risk podcast. I've been on his podcast. He has a great podcast. News. A lot about real estate, puts out a lot of great content. So we're going to talk a lot about real estate, a lot about insurance. But Jeremy, thanks so much for joining us today. We're really excited for our conversation. Lee, I'm excited to be here. I love what you're doing. I love the journey that you're on and that you've really shared that with your listeners and with folks oh, on LinkedIn you. and social media. Yeah. And it's been inspiring to see how you're, you're going on your journey in real estate. And I'm happy to talk for the next little bit about my journey too. Yeah. Thanks, Jeremy. I'm right back at you. I mean, you, you put out a lot of great content on uh, social media and I'm always seeing it because we're, we're, you know, very well connected. And I, I always like looking at that, um, checking out what you're doing and, and the content you're putting out, the guests you have on. Um, you know, we know a lot of the same people for, for those reasons, but let's get in the insurance part because, you know, that's kind of what you focus on. Let's get in that. But, but first, Jeremy, do you mind, how did you get so involved with, with real estate? I mean, you, you can be an insurance agent or insurance broker and, and not be so involved in real estate, but can you tell us that a little bit? Absolutely. So I was an elementary school teacher for 13 years before I started Shine Insurance. I, lo I loved teaching. Yeah. I, loved, I loved educating. I loved helping people. I was, a, like I said, third and fourth grade teacher. And I was like, I'll never be a first and second grade teacher because in first and second grade, you have to teach kids how to write. You have to teach kids how to read. You have to teach kids how to do basic math. In third and fourth grade, you get to teach them how to love something, right? You get to teach mm -hmm. them how to love a book because now they've yeah. got the foundation of reading. You get to teach them how to, I don't think I ever taught them how to love math, but I tried, you know, I, like they were, I, you know, and so I felt like I got to teach people how to love something. And so when I switched to insurance in 2013, I didn't want to lose that. And so I was just looking for how do I continue to educate people? And of course, I was educating people about insurance. But what I found, I started my journey as a home and auto insurance guy. And it was a lot of people who were buying their first house. Yeah. And so they would ask me about insurance, but then they would ask me about like, okay, so what's an escrow period? Like, what's a closing? What's a title company? How do I find a good realtor? How do I find a good lender? Like they were asking me all these questions generally about buying houses. Sure. And, and so I started interviewing realtors and interviewing lenders and interviewing title company owners and appraisers and, and, and uh, inspectors and, and the like. And I started uh, putting that on YouTube and it just kind of blew up. It was like people needed that information. Need and what to, I realized, yeah. what I realized was like insurance and real estate were, were connected and that was my passion. And yeah. so I can, I stayed in the home and auto world. And then I started teaching people how to invest in single family homes and all those kinds of things. And then now I'm really in, ingrained in the commercial real estate world. This is the only thing I do on the insurance side. Our commercial real estate insurance program okay. is hundred percent of what I do and commercial real estate as a whole with my podcast and with all the clients we have and just the community we've built, as you know, is, yep. is just what I do now. So yeah. it really came out of educating. 
Um, I come from a family of, of uh, grade school teachers. So I, I love that story. I love how that got started and wanting to continue that. And I can totally see how, like you say, you know, you're, you're, you're selling insurance, you're helping people get, get good insurance, but they're coming to you with these real estate questions. So kind of blossom out of that. What got you into it though, Jeremy? So you're, you're teaching people about it and, and I'm kind of seeing parallels here. You know, people come from the banking industry and they're writing loans on this stuff and they're going, wow, this, like, these are, these guys are really smart. Like they're, I want one of those loans. Like I, I, I want to be on the other side of the table. And so was it some of that or how did you go from, yeah, kind of starting to get an insurance and you're seeing more and more about real estate. How did you go? I want to, I want to do that. I want to do real estate on the side. So I'm a passive real estate investor. I'm not an okay. active real estate investor. Okay. So yep. as far as I believe in the philosophy of you have to have an active income somehow, and you have to take a portion of that active income and invest it into a passive element, which then yep. grows and becomes more and more passive. And Love so my yes. active income is the insurance piece, right? I'm, I'm serving people on the insurance side. Obviously I'm making money for that. And so that is my active income. And I take that and then put it into uh, real estate deals. Cause I'm fortunate enough to see a lot of real estate deals. I've, obviously when yep. someone says, Hey, I need some insurance for my 150 unit apartment that I'm picking up. Um, they send over OMs and T12s and rent rolls and all that kind yep. of stuff. And so I can see a good deal. And so I've become a passive investor in those deals. And I, I have no interest in being an active investor. I'm a service team member and that's what I wanna be. Sometimes when I see people who are service team members and are active investors, I'm like, man, I don't know how you do both those things well. I love how you frame that. And that's that's a lot of you know the stuff we put out. I mean, I, I talk and I say, I'm an active real estate investor. I'm not trying to tell everybody else to be an active real estate investor. I love it. I, I love every part of it. I love doing it as a job, but I, I just think everybody should be investing in real estate. But yeah, for 90, 95% of people, it means, you know, investing passively because you have another job. So you, you saw the, the, the power of that and started educating on that. Let's transition a little bit more into the insurance side. So where do you start with people? Where do you see people, you know, maybe kind of mess up? Um, not, not being protected, you know, what, what are the biggest risks to a commercial real estate investor's success when, when maybe it comes to insurance? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. And the first thing is a word you just used, and that is risk. I think we have to understand the concept of risk a little bit more deeply before we get into insurance. And that is when we decide to do something big, something like investing in commercial real estate or single family, residential, whatever your listeners are investing in, we're deciding to take a pretty big risk right? We're yep. deciding to go out there and, you yep. know, purchase a property. Uh, hopefully we're doing it with a fair amount of other people's money. Um, but some of our money is in that as well. And obviously we want to make sure that we fulfill the, the promises we made to other people when they bring their capital into it as well. So the concept of risk and the idea that we want to be able to protect the things that we're purchasing is super foundational and super key. I think the mistake that I see people make the most, I say about 80% of real estate investors have insurance policies that will fail them. And I sometimes I think that number is low when I see the mm. policies come in. When, when someone comes to me, I say, hey, let, show me what you've got right now. I'll go out to my company, see what I can get, get, and I'll compare those things. And when someone shows me what they have, so often they have policies that are junk. It's their absolute junk. And, and I think the biggest mistake I see people make is thinking that insurance is just a transactional commodity and that we should just buy the cheapest possible policy we can find. Yeah. It's sort of like if you go and get sunscreen in a convenience store and there's five different kinds and one's $5 and another $7, another $11. And there's a big jug that's 10 times as big as all those others. <laughs> and it's for a dollar. Yeah. Right. And you're like, wow, it's water. <laughs> which one should I pick? It's pretty, like we say, every listener who hears this is like, yeah, don't pick the dollar one. Right. <laughs> but it's the cheapest one. And there's a ton of yeah. it. It's a great and deal. Right. We can see that when we're looking at sunscreen, when we're looking at insurance policies, we can't see it. And that's the problem. We can't tell the difference. It's too complicated. I don't get it. I'm going to buy the cheapest one. And too often it's that bottle of water that says sunscreen on the outside. Sure. Sure. No, really well said. You know, I, I can think of a couple, uh, you know, personal examples and we, we haven't been bitten by it yet because, um, you know, we had a good a referral um, to, to, to an insurance company, but then um, actually my business partner that I had, had another really good relationship when we even went in with him. And it was some of that, him coming in going, guys, you're actually not protected as, as well as you want to be. Um, yeah. And man, when you hear that, I mean, Jeremy, this is where it comes to, you know, as an active sponsor, 
you've just got to underwrite it to be able to take on the expense of good insurance. I mean, that's what you have to do. You just got to put it in your underwriting. And if it doesn't work on having expense, you know, good insurance, then, then the deal doesn't work, you know, versus, Hey, I can make it work if I, you know, get the cheapest insurance because you can get in trouble. And just a couple of examples. And I'm sure you can kind of speak on these. I mean, we just had a fire at one of our properties. The insurance is covering us very well. Um, and, and so we're so glad that we have that because it's a mess. Um, and, and if we weren't made whole, it, you know, it'd be tough to dig out of. I mean, we're talking mm. about hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, right. and it wasn't that big of a fire. I mean, we're talking yeah. toasted one unit and then got out in the hallway a little bit, but man, the costs add up fast. Right. And then we have lost yeah. revenue. They're even, you know, helping us with the lost revenue of the evacuating yeah. people. So we're seeing kind of on the side of some of the good having good insurance and how important that is because you're right, Jeremy, you are taking more risks. So the best thing you can do is take that risk, but hedge that risk with, with, with good insurance, with, with reserves. I mean, we could, with good debt, like you can, you know, there's so many different things, but insurance is certainly mm -hmm. one of them. Um, and so I'm sure you have stories where people didn't do that and had a fire and, and, and they're up a Creek. Yeah. I mean, let me dissect the situation that you just had. So, so $500,000 loss, right? And so I don't know, let's say your deductible was maybe $10,000, maybe less, yeah, something maybe like that, $5,000, five yep. right? So in that scenario, if it plays out right, um, you'll, let's just use $500,000 as, as that number, right? So you would get $490,000 paid out if you had a solid replacement cost policy. You yep. did not have a co-insurance clause that took away from your payout based on how much you insured the entire building for, which we don't need yeah. to get in the weeds on, but that can be another thing that takes down your, your policy amount, your payout amount. So you would have got a $490,000 payout. Plus, as you described, if it was going to take um, a year to get those two units yep. back running. And those two units were renting for $1,000 a piece. So that's $24,000 right there. So on top of that 490, because you had loss of income coverage, that $29,000 or $24,000 that you lost in income because you could not rent those places was also paid to you as well. So I know I'm oversimplifying, but bottom line, a payout of about 500 and uh, what, 513, $514,000 yep. um, instead of nothing or what I see a lot is all those things I just said add up. A co-insurance co penalty is huge. If you underinsure your property, let's say that entire property was a $5 million property yeah. and you insured it for 4 million. So you're 20% underinsured for the entire property. Yeah. The insurance company in that scenario, depending on the co-insurance clause, could underpay you even for that smaller claim by 20%. Wow. So that $500,000 claim becomes a $400,000 right. payout. Yep. And so you lost $100,000 because your insurance agent, you know, or your insurance policy uh, had a co-insurance penalty. Um, fires are covered on almost every type of policy, but you get into other types of claims and then, you know, was it covered at all? Or if it's a wind or hail, a storm claim, then you get into these really high deductibles, particularly in Tennessee or excuse me, in Texas or Louisiana or Florida, you can't avoid these high deductibles. Yeah. But you can really get into scenarios if you don't do it right, where you have a $500,000 claim and there's a $300,000 payout or a $200,000 payout <sighs> yes. or something that like that. Hurt. And you're experiencing, that you. and it all, it already, no matter what happens with the money, we're talking about the money right now. And that's what insurance's job is to handle the money. No matter what happens with the money, it's already a pain in your butt. Yes. It's already a thing you have to deal with, a thing you have to get people to come in and remediate and rebuild and contractors and stuff and things. And maybe your property manager ha handles it some, but you're dealing with it, right? You cannot pass that risk on to other people. The risk of spending your time and energy dealing with that I mean, you can to property managers and stuff like that, but that's not insurance's job, right? So insurance yep. is, is taking the money piece. There's already a, st a lot to do. And then oh, yeah. if the money piece doesn't get handled right, now it's it's even more of a, a sorry for the metaphor, but more of a burn. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. For sure. Yeah, well, well played metaphor because yeah, absolutely it would be. Um, yeah, and, and just another example, Jeremy, you know, a, a property that we're getting into, they have, they have a policy on it, but you know, the federal Pacific- Electric um, boxes, breakers, yeah, breakers, breaker yeah, the breakers, yeah, yep. that, mm -hmm. that you know nobody likes anymore, or whatever, and it's hard to get insurance. Well, they have an insurance policy on it right now, um, so they were like, hey, just you know, just 
just talk to this agent. He'll give you an insurance policy on it. But, you know, right away we thought, well, we need to look into that because sure, you might have an insurance policy that doesn't care about Federal Pacific, but it might be that they don't care about it because they have written in there that if a fire were caused by those, they wouldn't cover it or something like that, 100%, right? I mean, it's those kind 100%. of risks that we're like, well, we don't know yeah. that we want that plan just because they're willing to, to give you insurance. That might not be the insurance we want, you know, where, because it's just like you said, Jeremy, you know, that risk. I mean, there is a risk that those, you know, meter boxes would, would cause a fire. And then if we're not covered, we are sunk because I think you and I both obviously really believe in multifamily investing. Mm-hmm, and 100%. it's a great investment. It's going to work, but it it's not going to work if if you have a bad situation that you weren't protected against. Yeah. And I think that the the bottom line to all of it is is really around making sure that one, we keep our insurance costs, well, we keep our insurance policies correct. So you want to tell people your 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 agent the truth. And you want to believe that your agent is telling the company the truth. So for those breaker boxes, for example, there's a couple of things that could be the case. One, the insurance company could truly be covering the property pro- properly. Mm-hmm. And if that uh, breaker box causes a fire, it's going to be covered. I would, if that's going to be the case, and it's probably a higher price for the insurance, because you got to go to a different company, they'll say yes to that. Yep. Now you could also go to a company uh, where you could also not tell them about the breaker box. Like, you know, you could choose not to tell them or your agent could choose not to tell the company after that you told them. And that's the situation where you get into what you were talking about, Lee, where you have a fire, it was caused by those old breaker boxes, and suddenly you're you're getting no coverage at all. And my yeah. advice would be, if you've got old breaker boxes like that, or aluminum aluminum, aluminum wiring is a little bit harder because it's so much more expensive to, right. to replace. But, you know, breaker boxes are $800 a breaker box, you know, mm-hmm. and most if you've got a good contractor friend probably could do it for five. And, you know, you may as well replace things that might right. burn down properties. There's nothing, <laughs> right. there's nothing worse. And I've, I've done it. So I know than standing next to a property owner who's just had a terrible fire like you've experienced, but there were injuries or even worse as a part of that. Hopefully yeah. that wasn't the oh, case yeah. in your scenario, yeah. um, but it is awful. And if you know you did everything as a property owner, it's a lot less bad than if you feel like maybe there's something you could have done. So I feel like one of the things I'm trying to do is not only be an insurance agent, talk about how insurance works, but also say, hey, these are risks too. Maybe that insurance company wants you to get rid of those breakers because there's actually a chance that they could cause a fire and maybe you don't want that. Yeah, absolutely. No, 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 right right there with you. I mean, and that's something, you know, for us as we're looking at, we're like, let's just come in with the capital to, to take care of this. Tell me a little bit more just about the passion you have behind educating people in real estate. Cause I mean, it, it's gone so far beyond just answering some, you know, some questions for your, for your insurance clients. Uh, you, you do so much, but tell, tell me about the passion behind that for you. You know, I think, like I said, it did, it really did start with first time home buyers. And I think that's important because we've all bought a house or maybe we well, It's amazing how many real estate investors I know that rent their home, by the way, which is an interesting fact. I've never really dug into that, but anyway, <laughs> uh, but um, you know, it, it started there. And I think the passion is for the community. One of the things I love about this community is I've met so many people from so many different backgrounds Mm -hmm. with all different stories, with all different places they come from, whether it's life stories or spiritual stories, or even what companies or what countries they live in, right? One of my best friends in this industry is Billy Keels. He lives in Barcelona, Spain. I live in Bloomington, Indiana, right? We live 4,000 miles away from each other. And we, we have a passion here meeting a guy like Lawrence Laddie, who uh, ran trains in New York City for 40 years wow. and ultimately got into real estate after that. Um, you know, I would go to real estate meetups and he would be, you know, uh, talking uh, not from the train or anything like that, but, you know, be around the, tr- the train work while uh, he was in these meetups. And it's just all the different people you meet and, and uh-huh. the connections you make. And you realize that no matter what someone's background is, no matter what their story is, if we have a commonality that brings us together, it all works itself out. And I think real estate has been that for me. And that's really what's made this, you know, made real estate exciting um, and just made this community exciting. Yeah, that, that's really cool. I, I actually just got to talk to, to Billy uh, just a couple of weeks ago. I was on his podcast and he's, he's from Columbus, Ohio. So, you know, uh-huh. we, have, we have a connection, even though he's over there. Great guy. Um, yeah. yeah, really well said, Jeremy. I, I've, I've really enjoyed that about the, the real estate community as well. And, and, you know, just 
to kind of build on your point, it, anybody can get into this. A- anybody can do this. Um, and like I said, you, you and I both, we, we really, you know, understand and believe in multifamily as an investment vehicle uh, that anybody can benefit from. And you can do it actively or passively. But, you know, just kind of the, the, the point of our conversation, you, you have to protect against the risk because mm-hmm. you are taking risk. Um, there's a lot of reward here, but there's there's more risk than, than some other uh, investments where there's there's less reward. So, 100%. Yeah. You, know, you protect those risks, then you can move forward. Um, and, and, and take those risks and, and do very well if you're mm-hmm. well protected. So yeah, re- really well said there. Yeah, yeah. I think risk, you know, I would say risk and reward are two sisters and one of them, like many of us, many of your listeners probably have kids and you know, you have the one kid who's just always causing trouble is always out there. Just make you feel like you're just constantly chasing. You love that kid almost sometimes more than the others, just because they're like interesting and crazy and weird. And you're like, oh, like I'm so mad at you. And I'm so fascinated by you all at the same time. Oh yeah. Like that's risk, right? It's that thing that we like love (laughs) to take. We love to get connected with. We want to do more of as long as we've one, got the reward on the other side. We're not going to take risk without reward. And two, we're managing it. We know like when you have that kid who's causing trouble and all those kinds of things, you've got to figure out how to manage that kid. Is it timeouts? You know, is it taking away something that they have? Is it really talking them through it? What is going to manage that kid? And and I think risk is very similar to that, right? And if you can get that to work, then the reward is there too. I think the metaphor breaks down a little bit with how those connect, but you you sure, sure. No, uh, well said. Yeah, and, and perfect transition, Jeremy, because I'd love to talk a little bit about your 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 family and just you know kind of your investing. So, um, I'm I'm assuming you've done quite a few passive investments and, and been doing that for a while, kind of built that up. What's you know for you just as a passive investor, what, what's what's that done for you and your family? I'm pretty early in my passive investing journey. Just a couple of big deals and okay, then a cool. few smaller deals. So probably just a couple of years in, like it really isn't starting to bring back around the, yep. the funds. Again, the insurance agency is really the thing that it actually acts a lot like real estate, right? So you have some passive income. You think about uh, renewals, right? When you go out and get your home and auto insurance or whatever kind of insurance, a lot of times you stick around for four or five years, especially if those people take care of you, Yep. right? And so that money is coming in as kind of like a passive, uh, it's a cash flow. It's the same as cash flow and multifamily, other kinds of commercial real estate. And then there's the active piece, which is going out and, you know, acquiring new clients in my case, or new properties in the real estate case. Yeah. And so I think a lot of, you know, alignment between uh, the, and, and actually there's a lot of people investing in insurance agencies right now. There's very few insurance agencies like mine that are truly still independent agencies owned by the founders, uh, because as with real estate, people are buying them up. But your question was about passive investing. And so really the passive investment uh, has not come back in a financial way at this point in any like huge action. Sure. I can't say like I've got six thousand dollars a month in passive yeah. cash flow yep. uh, yet. But again, the the active income is coming from the insurance side, moving to the real estate side, and growing our family in that way, and really creating a lifestyle. I don't have a wild lifestyle. I'm very sure. comfortable in a you know I got a sixteen hundred square foot house in Midwestern Bloomington, Indiana. But uh, it's so, just, yeah, it's, you know, yeah, I appreciate you saying that, Jeremy, because that, that is real life. I mean, this is not a get rich quick scheme. Uh, certainly not if you're doing it passively. Um, you know, there's there's less yeah. risk as a passive investor, so less reward. But it it is the way you framed it. It builds. You know, this isn't Bitcoin that you're hoping you know uh, goes up five <laughs> yeah. times because it also isn't like Bitcoin where it can go down, uh, cut in half. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, but it comes back to, you know, it comes back to the real estate and why real estate is so exciting. You know, it's like you can meet so many different people from so many different backgrounds. You can engage with, you know, you can engage in real estate if you're incredibly wealthy. In fact, most of the wealthiest mm-hmm. people in the world do. And right. you can engage in real estate if you have nothing. You can be yep. boots on the ground and yeah. find a deal and get into something uh, from nowhere. You can be on yep. any scale of that. And I think you can also take any scale of risk, right? I'm taking a fairly yep passive risk by passively investing, making limited cash flow. It's certainly better than investing in stocks, um, but it's not as good as probably your percentages you're making off an act, active deal. Sure. But right. I could go invest actively in a, you know, I think of a property in Montgomery, Alabama, that's really fascinating to me. Um, 150 units, 20 buildings, I think, 20% occupied, 
many of those buildings 100% vacant, boards on the windows. What happened was an international investor came in about five years before I saw this deal and just started tapping that property and just pulling money, pulling money, pulling yep. money, not putting, putting anything back, back into it. Yeah. So they crashed it. And um, some clients of mine were looking at it and considering buying it. I was considering investing in the deal with them because all the complexes around that complex were doing great. Montgomery, Alabama is a state capital. It has a whole mix of different kinds of industries there. Everything about the market was really, really good. It was just that the property had been drawn down in such a terrible way that it was in this state that no one else could see it. That's a really risky deal. Sure. If we're wrong, we're in big trouble, yep. right? And so as a passive investor, I could go into that deal with $100,000 and, and maybe 3X my money, but I could lose it all a lot easier than a stable uh, Evansville, Indiana yeah. property that's got yep. 95% occupancy. Yeah. That's yeah. the fun of real estate is no matter which element you're looking at, whether you're a service provider or an active investor, however you're in it, there's all sorts of different ways you can play it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Good stuff, man. Hey, I like to, to, to kind of wrap things up here. I always like to ask at the end, what, what's the key ingredient uh, to be a successful real estate investor? Maybe, maybe that on your end has something to do with, um, maybe it's, to, to protect yourself well or something, but, but what would you, how would you answer that question? I, I think it's decision-making. It's your capacity to understand how to make smart decisions and make them quickly, right? There's three yeah. E's in every good decision, education, experience, and your entourage, right? You can en educate okay. yourself. Someone listening to this show is educating themselves, learning about real estate in a passive way, but there's nothing better than experience. Getting in that first deal you got in Lee and then getting in that 40 unit, I think it was, you know, that you uh, jumped yep. from, yep. right? Yep. And those are, those are experiences that now are, you're building on top of, you're learning from, there's nothing, you took education first and then you got into the experience of it, yep. but there's nothing bigger than your entourage, right? And that is the people around you who maybe have more experience than you, who For have sure. more education than you, who are able able to build that property. And I think decision-making using that education, experience, entourage, the three E's is the most important thing that I can impart on your listeners around how to move forward and have success in real estate. Yeah. Well said. I love that. I mean, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And you're right. I mean, good memory there with, with the, the, the 40, 45 unit uh, property in my, my story all the way back from when I was on uh, your great podcast, um, mm -hmm. Jeremy. Hey, so a little spin on that. What, a, what would you say is a key ingredient for while you're having success in real estate investing, maintaining your priorities? And, you know, if, if for you, that's your family, maintaining your family as a priority. I mean, you're, you're not only a real estate investor on the passive side, but you're, you know, you're an entrepreneur, you're running a business, you're a business owner. How do you maintain your priorities while you're doing all that? Oh, man. I mean, you know, it's hard. I, I think that um, I, I've learned more from failing than from anything else. I mean, sure. I, if I let myself do what my natural uh, inclination is, I would come into this office at 6.45 a.m., write a LinkedIn post, and then do everything all day long until 6.30 when my wife comes in and says, hey, we haven't seen you all day. What's going on, right? Like, I think that's a weakness that I've had to work through. And sure. I think yep. part of what I do with that is create structured boxes in, in your day. Well, one, one is saying committing to the fact that, hey, my family is just as important as the work that I do. This is not an escape. This is not a place to go and hide from all the other parts of my life, which I think yeah. men in general, you know, can sometimes be guilty For of. Sure. Yep. Um, that I've got a balanced life that comes with my own personal spirituality, my own personal growth, my family and the relationship with my family and my work. And all of them have an important part of, of who I am. And as, as I, as myself personally, and I think men and oftentimes in general, we go to that work. And as long as we're workhorse and workhorse and workhorse, and it feels like, well, we're doing the thing for our family, yeah. we're doing the thing for ourselves, but it's just not true. And so I think stepping back and giving myself time, creating space, uh, my, uh, to my Wednesday afternoons, me and my 15 year old, we just have like three hours that we just spend together and we pick between one of three things and we just go do it. That's just yep. one simple thing. You know, yeah. I, I don't have all the answers on the balance piece. Um, but I think it's important. I totally agree. Jeremy. I mean, you, you've got that time blocked out for your, for your child. And so you can't put a meeting in there because it's. I think that's so important. I mean, yeah, you're you're absolutely right. I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, women can fall into it too, but men in, in, in general, for sure. Yeah, left to my own devices, I would just work. 
Um, I just work a lot and, and fall into it and, get, you know, have to be pulled mm-hmm. out. Uh, and then, oh my goodness, I, I miss all that time. And, and, and then, you, you know, years can go by like that. Um, so yeah. hey, we're, we're being diligent about getting everything on our schedule for work and making sure work's going well and the business, you know, you and I are both uh, entrepreneurs, business owners, and, and we've got all this stuff scheduled to make sure that's running smoothly. Why would we not get our kids on the, on the schedule? Right. And, and sometimes that's what it takes. And, and I don't think there's anything wrong with feeling like you got to be intentional to get them on your schedule, make mm-hmm. sure it happens. So I love that. I uh, appreciate mm-hmm. that. Um, like I think yeah. communicating with your spouse or your, yeah. kid, like, I think yeah. that communication is because I think we, there are traditional roles and there, but I, I think roles are important. It doesn't, sure. to me, it doesn't matter who's in what role. Yeah. You know, and I think uh, it's it's that we've sat, we've talked about like everyone having ownership over a role in a family is important or you're always stepping on each other's toes. Mm-hmm. And so I think communication between your family members is really important. What are our roles? And that's true in a business and that's true in your personal life. I just thought of it and I, I thought that was important to say. Yeah, yeah, that is absolutely. Yes. And communi- man, communication has been so big for my life. And I, I like you have learned through mistakes mostly. <laughs> it's, you know, yeah, it's, it's a struggle. Do. Yeah. Entrepreneurial journey is, is a struggle. Well, good stuff, man. Um, yeah. Hey, I, a lot of times I like to ask for a, a, a book recommendation. Anything you've read recently or, or a good book recommendation? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, I, I think I've been reading, I, I love Hunter Thompson's book. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't have it in front of me right now, but it's a, it comes from an active, it's like how to raise capital. Do you know the name of the, the title of that? It's Hunter Thompson's book. And I, um, I read it too, and I can't remember, but it, yeah, I think raising capital is in the title. Yeah. And I just feel like no matter whether you're raising capital or you're investing passively or, you know, you're just investing in real estate, the way he lays things out and just makes it so clear. I took it on vacation recently and was sitting on, sitting on a beach, reading a book about real estate, you know, Jeremy, I want to send people to, to, um, over to you, you know, whether it's insurance needs or just to learn more about real estate. Um, I've got here the, the shineinsurance.com, uh, they can Mm -hmm. do that. Um, Slash ballpark, and then I know you're uh, very active on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Are those the best places to to look you up? Yeah, I think the simplest value I can add right now to your listeners is if you're underwriting multifamily deals and you're looking at that insur- insurance line and you're not sure, go to shineinsurance.com slash ballpark and you put in five or nine questions. They're yes or no questions and immediately get a ballpark insurance number. So oh, don't nice. listen to the guru. Don't listen to the seller. I uh, don't certainly don't listen to the broker because they're going to show you a number that, you know, makes the deal look more profitable. Yeah. Go over sure. to shineinsurance.com slash ballpark. Just get a ballpark number that's actually going to fit in your underwriting. Good. Yeah, that's great. That's a, that's a really good resource, Jeremy. I appreciate that. We'll put that in the show notes, obviously, to get everybody over there. Um, great, man. Well, hey, before I let you go, I always like to ask my uh, guests, how might my listeners and I be praying for you in the coming weeks? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, interesting. My dad is a, a minister. And he had a stroke about uh, oh, wow. uh, two yeah. months ago, and he's a an absolute leader in the you know Calvary Chapel movement. We started in San Diego when I was a kid. You know, I always say in the seventies, late sixties, early seventies in California, there were two groups of people: people dropping out on drugs and people dropping out on Jesus. And my dad was in the dropping out on Jesus side. They started a commune and you know did this whole thing and wow. and really built this community around. Uh, that and ultimately moved to Indianapolis and and uh, has had a church in Indianapolis for the last 20 years or so. And and on, uh, you know, probably it'll be, uh, he will have recently retired when this show goes out. He retires a, a few days from now. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I think just praying for him and, yeah. and uh, that he gets all his uh, function back and memory back and capacity back. It's a real struggle coming back from a stroke. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Jeremy, be happy to pray for your dad and along with that. I mean, yeah, so much going on and I'm sure it's tough to, to retire, you know, and, and give that up. He's been at it so long, but, and, and yeah, certainly mm-hmm. in the circumstances it makes it even more difficult with the, the strokes. Strokes are a nasty thing. Uh, can be really yeah. tough. So yeah, I'd be happy Absolutely. to pray for that. Good. Cool. Well, thanks, Jeremy. I uh, really appreciate your time, man. It's been really good stuff. I mean, uh, you know, I, I've, I've not been in the game that long and, and have a couple examples of, you know, where, where insurance is coming really uh, handy uh, for sure and, and uh, saved us. Uh, and, and some, uh, you know, maybe some close calls and just, I, I know it's super important. So I really appreciate what you're doing. Thanks for coming on and sharing that with us. Love it, Lee. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Take care, Jamie. Thank you for joining us for another great episode. I hope you'll take action on what you've learned today. If you enjoyed today's show, please consider leaving Lee a five-star rating and review and check him out on threefoldrei.com. 
Until next time, 1 Timothy 6.17.